everyone. Welcome to Tiny Desk Knitting with Emma. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about my Bray cardigan, which is a, um, here it is. It's a v-neck cardigan and the pattern is published in The Art of Fair Isle Knitting by Anne Feidelson, which is a book from 1996, I think. First published in 19... 96, yeah. Um, so it's a little bit of an older um, resource. It's crazy because I was born after, before 1996. Um, not that much, <laughs> but some years before that. And uh, and it to me, that's like, oh, it's not old, but like, I'm not a child anymore. Like in terms of academic reference books, that would be really old. Um, although it's knitting, so it doesn't matter. It's just that um, the way it's presented is definitely not um, like modern knitting patterns. So this book is great. It has lots of history, lots of color, great information about color actually. Like I've um, talked about this in an episode, I think it's episode seven, I talk about reference books and I talked about this in more detail so I won't um, go into it now, but it's a really, really good reference for color. Um, and there's there aren't like charts like, you know, um, there's not like a chapter on, here's a bunch of Fair Isle charts, like there are in Alice Starmore's book or Sheila McGregor's book, but, um, there are a lot of actual patterns and the patterns are well written and, um, they're also, like, they have lots of charts that you might use for other patterns that you can mix and match. So I really recommend this book if you can get it, um, like, used or... You can probably get it new, but it might be expensive. I don't even know if it's still in print, um, but it's great. It's a really good reference. So 10 out of 10. Um, so this is the Bray cardigan. This is the actual pattern. It's not very long. There's a lot of text, not a lot of pictures, although there's obviously a set of charts. Um, so there it is. It's a little shorter than the one I'm gonna end up making. Um, the vertical gauge is a bit different. Um, for instance, they tell you, they'll tell you what, for like a size small, say, which is the size that I'm knitting, it'll be like, stop on this round of the chart and do your, um, like, put some stitches on hold and do your sleeve steaks. And um, mine was like nine inches long at that point, as I've mentioned in another video. Um, so I, uh, I like kept going and I'll just start the chart again at the bottom if, if I run out. Of, um, of rows, so that's fine, it doesn't matter. But it's, um, yeah, mine, so this is originally, as you can see again, this is reds and pinks. There's a little bit of blue and orange in there. Mine is greens with one pop of pink. Pink in the middle. So that's sort of a traditional way to do a Fair Isle piece, um, is you have a one, one scheme and then a pop that doesn't necessarily um, match with the scheme, but it looks good. Um, I think this looks good. I mean, it's kind of a, it's definitely a pop. Um, so to choose the colors for this, I actually just thought about how this was laid out in terms of using pinks and purples and reds and how those colors went together. And I basically just shifted the scheme to green and I chose colors of similar um, value and tint if possible. Um, I had some changes of mind after I knit the first a few rounds of the chart and I changed my mind on one of the colors. Um, this is something that I have done before. This happened when I did the Mayonnaise cardin cardigan as well. So if you watch episode um, six, I think it's episode six, um, which is the Mayonnaise cardigan video, you can see that I, uh, I did a different uh, color on the very first um, like round of the chart that I then swapped out for a different color. Subsequently, I did the exact same thing here. So you can see very faintly here, this this like grass colored green, it didn't contrast enough, I thought, with the darker green. So I swapped it for like a celery green for the rest of them. So again, I don't care, it's my cardigan. Um, I do what I want. <laughs> I don't mind, I didn't rip it out. I like it, it's like, you know, it reminds me that it's the process to do this. Um, so I've blocked the body already at least I blocked part of it and then I went and continued to knit. So I blocked up to up to here so you can see it. It's pretty uh pretty nice. Um and for the 
stick bridge I you can see here that there's a bunch of ends but before that I just cut the ends off and I've already needle felted that because I didn't want them to unravel um so that's one of the nice things about knitting a cardigan is that you can just snip the ends right off you don't have to weave them in um I have wo woven in ends on a cardigan before but I didn't I was just too much of a chicken to just cut them off because you gotta pull them tight and then needle felt them right away um but yeah you can see there they're just hanging out I don't need to snip them or anything, which is super. Although you do have to weave them in on the sleeves because there are no sticks. Um, okay, so let's talk about colors. Yeah, nothing's, yeah, luckily this is a banded cardigan. So I just, I can just, it's not connected to anything right now, which is nice. I just put it down. Okay, no, that's in the wrong bag. <laughs> so the sort of main-ish color is this dark green. Um, all of these are two-ply jumper weight from Jameson and Smith, by the way. This is color 082 mix, 82 mix. It's like a dark heathered teal green. I've used this before. It's one of my favorite colors. Um, the this other background color that I'm using predominantly is uh, this one. It's shade FC46 mix. You can see that. It's kind of a grayish, brownish green. Um, in the middle of the bigger bands there is another green as a background color and it's this one which is fc12 mix this is kind of a yellower green yeah sort of mossy very heathered there's some orangey bits in there gold it's really nice um yeah so here are my three kind of main background colors okay and then I have um, this as one of the foreground colors. This is the only one that's not Jameson and Smith. Um, I did use one Supreme jumper weight, so they're not all two-ply jumper weight, but this is, um, what's it? Uh, Bio, BC Bio Garn Shetland, BC Bio Shetland. Um, it's like a brownish, I got it from Woolen Company in Chicago, so I'll link that site. Um, they call it Pebble, so it's kind of a brown. It's, I mean, it's similar to like these, but it's not green. It doesn't have any green in it. So kind of a heathery brown. I've got, um, let's see if there's a bigger ball. Here we go. Um, FC62 mix. This is a sage green heather. This is really nice. This is one of my favorite colors too. It goes really well with a dark teal, which is, um, these go together in the pattern sometimes. So that's nice. Um, and then there's this one, FC24 mix. This is a mix, although it looks more like a solid if you're just looking at it. This is kind of a celery green. Really nice. Um, I've got, well, this is really small. This came off of a cone. This is Jameson and Smith Jumper Weight Supreme in shade 2006. Gommel Gut. I never pronounced that correctly. I am positive. Um, and then I have my two, uh, like, where's the blue one? Oh, there it is, it is just hiding. These are the two um, brighter contrasts. These usually go together, although there's one section where this blue um, goes with the, the medium green, which is a nice contrast. This is a pale blue and lavender mix. It is called shade 1280. I think it's 1280 mix, but it might not be a mix. I mean, it is two mixed colors, so you'd think it was. And this is 72 mix which is like a strawberry. Heather, gray, red, pink. This is the color that everyone will tell you to use. They're like, if you can't figure out what to use for your pop of color, use 72. I can't remember where I read that, but it's like a thing that people say. Um, so those are the colors. Uh, it does tell you in this pattern how much of each you will need. Although um, I think I'm gonna be short cause I'm making it longer. So I've actually ordered a few more. Um, of each of these just in case and um, one of the nice things about this is that because the the colors um, like are broken up into bands you can use different dye lots and it won't be noticeable because they won't go right up next to against each other which is super um, so I'm, I'm glad about that um yeah that's all I have a lot of just like random balls in here uh, one thing I want to talk about really quickly is that um, the 
consistency of Jameson and Smith yarn, two ply jumper weight yarn is a little bit different than it used to be. So this is the old one and this one is new and I don't know if you can see it, but this one is a lot smoother. Um, it's still wool and spun. It just looks like the ball is like kind of smaller. It's like denser. Um, it just feels a lot smoother in the hand. Um, and I think that they're slightly smaller, like I weighed it and it wasn't quite 25 grams. Um, so, and I just noticed that because I ran out quicker than I thought I would of, uh, like a gray ball of this when I was knitting my, um, blue and gray cowl. So just be aware of that. Um, if you're using this yarn, it might be different if, uh, if you're ordering like the same color to use in the same project for different dye lots, it might feel and look a little bit different different consistency. I don't know why. I mean, it's fine. It doesn't detract from the knitting experience at all, but maybe other people haven't found this. Um, but if you have, I just want to make sure that I'm not crazy. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, Jameson and Smith. And then the one, um, one of the, of the yarns is different. It's, um, it's the Bio Shetland, which is, again, if you've seen my video on, um, I don't think I, talked about it in my cowl and cap video which is like episode eight or nine um I used one of them for that um or two of those those yarns those colors in um that set of cowl and cap uh, set and it was um it's thinner than two ply jumper weight or Shetland um spin drift from Jameson's of Shetland so be aware if you're not used to using um different slightly different gauges of yarn in your color work you should stick to the same yarn. Or you can stick to Shetland Spindrift and two-ply jumper weight. You can interchange those because they're basically the same. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the construction. I'm gonna grab this again. Um, I've talked about these before, but these are Coco Knits Stitch Stoppers and they're amazing. Uh, they are like, they, they're nice and tight on your needles so that they don't, stitches don't slip off because these are not gonna come off either. Knitting these on um, Xiaogu, there's the red cord, uh, on a US 2, which is a 2.75 millimeter, I think. Yeah. Um, that's my preferred pair aisle gauge. It gets me about uh, 31 stitches over four inches, which I find um, is good. If I knit on a one and a half, it's just too small. Like my Mayaness cardigan is not quite 32 stitches over four inches and so it's too small. I mean it's a cute, it's like a little cropped jacket, but it's not the cardigan that I thought it was gonna end up as. Um so I I switched to a US two. And I find that I knit um I don't pull the yarn as tight with Chow Goo needles as I do on the high high sharps. So Chow Goo and size two is my preferred um fair aisle combination. Um the Chow Goo lace are the best ones because they're sharper and they don't have the like rounded edges um, in the joints. This one's not a lace. You can see it's got the curved, I don't know if you can actually see that, but there's a, it's like a boomerang curve. There it is. Okay, so the construction. So this is about 15 and a half inches long so far, which is how long I wanted it before I split for the armhole sleeves or armhole um, steaks, sorry. Um, so the construction is really straightforward up to here. You just, do some corrugated ribbing. Mine is shorter than the pattern set, but I don't like doing corrugated ribbing and I didn't want these two colors to be overpowering, so I did a shorter band. Um, and I started my chart and I did, yeah, you basically knit until you feel like it's long enough um, and measure yourself and measure your sweater to make sure you um, make a good decision on that or measure your person who you're knitting it for. Um, and then, so after this, there will be a sleep split. So I will, you know, I'm gonna use the, the book will tell me cause I'm actually knitting it um, to the, the size, one of the sizes in the book. So they'll tell me how many, like knit this many and then put seven stitches or whatever, however many like on hold or bind them off or cast them off. Um, generally either one works cause you're gonna pick up those stitches. So it doesn't matter if they're live or you just pick them up um, and they're cast off. Um, and you will, uh, you will, so you'll either put them on hold or, or bind them off, cast them off. Those, that means the same thing. Some people prefer to say bind off and some people prefer to say cast off. Um, and then you'll cast on sleeves, steak stitches on the next round, um, over that, uh, spot. So, um, that's, 
uh, and then you'll you'll do like the same thing like the stripes um, alternating colors um, for the sleeve steaks but this is a v-neck so that means that once I separate for the sleeves I'm also going to be shaping the v-neck um, so you work the decreases at the front edge you work them alongside the steak here um, which is uh, makes it when you're actually knitting it it's gonna look like it's pointing inward but then once you cut it apart they'll which is weird um, they'll they'll spring apart and fit like a bee um, so that's cool uh, you need to be careful when you do something like that any kind of shaping on the front means that you're gonna start um, you're gonna like start your round farther in from the first stitch every time and um, that's a little bit um, tricky so I recommend uh, putting a marker at like the first stitch of or the first stitch of the first full pattern repeat so that you count, can count backwards and figure out where you're supposed to start because um, it works visually but if you're doing a cardigan with bands like this one um, sometimes they don't start the beginning of the round isn't the same on the chart for each band like this one, it'll be like size small start at this stitch and not at the front of the chart. Um, whereas the small bands all start at the front because they're uh, the stitch counts are smaller. So you have to be careful with that. Um, and that will be the case with sleeve shaping as well because um, you're going to taper the sleeve gradually and your beginning of round is going to move on the chart because of the stitches that you're decreasing. So that's important. Um, and then I mean, I'm going to film more videos about this. When you're shaping the back neck, um, you're going to end up putting the, some of the stitches from the front on hold to, to make the back of the neck uh, higher. And this is something that, yeah, you still have to do it on a V-neck. It's something that's much more obvious on a crew neck because um, you're going to, like, this is a crew neck shirt, for instance. You're going to start, you'd put stitches on hold here and then you do the decreases gradually around the neck. Um, while continuing to knit straight on the back of the neck. And so on a, on a um, round neck, a crew neck cardigan, that would be the first place where you'd have to be paying attention to where, uh, where in the round you're starting um, because it would, you would be doing decreases. But on a V-neck, you start down here. It um, starts earlier, so that's fun. Um, and then of course, when you're all done with everything, like you knit the body, knit the sleeves, you, well, you secure the sleeve steaks, snip those open, knit the sleeves down, you're gonna finish everything with corrugated ribbing. So here it looks like um, you do the neck and the, and the body all in one big corrugated ribbed piece. Although in some, like in a rounder, rounded neck cardigan, um, you would do the neck ribbing first and then you would pick up Maybe that's the case here too. You just can't see. I'm not sure. Um, you then you'd pick up straight down the front um, your stitches for your uh, your button band. So that is fun. Um, talk a little bit about color um, again. This is a really good book if you're um, if you're interested in learning about color in Fair Isle knitting because she's got. Um, whole chapter on like what is value what is tint what is tone it's and she's it does all these swatches so that you can see like how different patterns look if you switch the colors in um in the in the pattern um it's like these these i don't know if this yeah that's this is these are examples um so she talks about like if you go from you know, light inside the, the two lightest, like the lightest dark and the lightest light, and you go towards the darkest dark and the darkest light. Um, Hazel Tyndall also talks a lot about that in her videos. So here's some other, like here's combinations for how to put these together. Um, very cool. So this is a good book because there's also a lot of patterns where you might like the colors that are used. Um, there's a really traditional jumper, yoke jumper, round yoke stuff like this pattern um or the, the colors are are great this one's really nice i think the the colors are really um well selected here blues and grays um but you can also use as i've said in other videos you can use other resources 
I love this book. I talk about it all the time, The Vintage Shetland Project by Susan Crawford, but the color scheme ideas in here are just really interesting. Um, like, look at that. That's a great Fair Isle palette because you got brown and the naturals and then you got that red for your pop of color. So it's really fun. Yeah, and there's some yellow in it too. Yeah, gorgeous. Um, and then you could get, yeah, Knitsonic, Stranded Color Work, Playbook, Sourcebook. These are great books that teach you lots about color. Um, here's the playbook. Um, you can take a photograph and create your um, your palette that way. Um, I do tend to stick to sort of like monochromatic palettes. For instance, this, these are all greens, except for the pink. And then the blue, I mean, this blue here, the 1280, um, it's, but it's, it's adjacent to green. Um, so the pink is really the only thing that, that really stands out. Um, and again, it's only like one round every, in the middle of every band. So not, um, not a huge thing, but it is, it is more traditional to do that. Um, so I tend to, yeah, I tend to stick to one color family, which really works. You just have to make sure, again, I have failed at this, that your, um, your contrast is high enough between each, um, you know, foreground and background pair. So one thing that some people have said you can do is that you can get a couple of balls out so I can show you. So here, this will demonstrate it really, really well. This is the 82 mix and this is 24 mix. So you take the ends like there and you twist them together. And if you can see each one distinctly, my face is in the way. It's Well, it's not in the way, it's focusing on my face. There you go. Um, you can see each one distinctly. That means it's high enough contrast to use. So I definitely have some spots where the contrast is lower in this cardigan. For instance, there this little cross, you can still see that, but there's a, um, this, let me just get them for you. Uh, that would be FC 46 and uh, 60, 62 FC 62 mix. Um, so these two are not as high contrast, um, but it's okay. It looks kind of cool actually. Um, I like it. It's, um, it kind of just makes it more like washed out. It looks like a watercolor. Yeah, you see that's harder. I mean, you can see the difference, but it's, you have to look more closely to see. Whereas the dark and the light were really, really obvious. So you can make choices about that. I mean, there's no right or wrong way to make your palette. Um, it's all about personal choice. So um, that's my first video of the Bray Cardigan by Anne Feitelson. And uh, yeah, I really encourage you to get that book if you can find it. I will put links to it in the show notes. Um, it might be hard to find because it could be expensive because you can only really get it used, um, but it's worth it. That's a good book to have as a reference. So yeah, this is, here it is. Doing this so that I can take a screenshot later. Um, for the thumbnail. Okay, all done. Um, yeah, there will be more in this series. So stay tuned for more Bray Cardigan adventures. And this has been Tiny Desk Knitting with Emma. Bye.